even a button is a plastic. Old-fashioned buttons, like all the extra ones on a Pearly King Sunday suit, used to be made of bone or shell. But he could now decorate himself with buttons of every shape and colour, all made of plastics. Plastics began with knife handles and piano keys. Now they play a part in almost everything. Radio and the telephone both depend on plastics. When Uncle George goes fishing. When Father goes to the city in an electric train. And when Mother goes to the shops and the cinema in a trolley bus, they are all depending on plastics. The story of every plastic begins in the laboratory. For chemists have found how to make durable material from things like coal, limestone, oil, molasses, and salt and water. Their work is based on the simple law of nature that one chemical process leads to another. For example, grass feeds on water and air, sheep feed on grass, and sheep produce wool. For centuries, men have dug raw material out of the ground using increasingly modern machinery to get all they want. But already, many of the natural storehouses are running low, and things that used to be considered waste are now put to valuable use. But who would have thought that factory chimney smoke would be full of rich treasure? But it yields carbon, which is needed for many kinds of plastics. Plastics take the place of many products that are difficult to obtain. Above all, we could not have such a modern electric power system without plastic insulation. So, as it is so important to modern life, let us see how a plastic is made. Suppose we start with a phenolic resin, which helps in the creation of many things from the dashboard of a motor car to tabletops. Two liquids derived from coal are heated together to form a thick syrup, poured into trays and left to cool. The result when it is set is a resin rather like hard treacle toffee, which you can break up in the same way. Chemicals for making all the plastics are stored in large drums or tanks. The resin is made in big stills or kettles. This is where the two liquids are heated together. They come out like treacle to be cooled in these large flat trays. The time it takes to set depends on the type of resin, the temperature of the factory, and whether it happens to be winter or summer, but usually it takes about a day. After being chipped out of the trays and broken up, it goes into a huge revolving drum to be ground into powder. Inside the drum are a number of porcelain balls, and as the drum rotates, they pulverize the bits of resin and grind it up. Here is the resin in the form of powder. Not quite as fine as face powder, but very nearly. Various types of other ingredients are added to it, including fillers, which help to strengthen the material at the stage when it becomes plastic. Next, these ingredients are stirred in closed mixers. But here you can see what happens as they are using a small open mixing tank. Door handles are one of the things that will be conjured out of this mixture in due course, and the original resin is also used as a basis for varnish. Later, the well-mixed powder is fed onto heated rollers. Under the influence of the heat, the resin softens, forming a plastic mass and binding all the ingredients. This takes place at a temperature of about 285 degrees Fahrenheit. Then, when this plastic, rubbery material has been cooled and ground into powder once again, it is ready for moulding. Making the moulds for moulded plastics is a very highly skilled job. Draftsmen design them in the drawing office, and then skilled toolmakers machine the different parts of the steel moulds in the toolmaking shop. On these skilled British workmen, shaping and grinding to such minute accuracy depends the faithfulness of reproduction because the work of one mould is to form an innumerable number of the same article, identical in every detail. In the mould-making shops, you will find the most modern machine tools, but the final finishing touches have to be done by hand, with extreme care and using an abrasive powder. The craftsmanship of these men means that perfect reproductions of intricate design are available to everybody. The molding powder we saw made from the original resin is weighed to the correct amount and poured into the heated mould. In some cases, this is done by hand, as you see here. But otherwise, a weighed charge of powder pours automatically into the mould cavity simply by touching a lever. You can well imagine how important it is to get the correct amount of powder into the mould. Too little would mean a faulty molding, too much would be a waste of an expensive material. When the mould closes, the powder softens with the heat into a putty, 
and gets forced into the shape of the mold. While this is happening, we can look at the complicated mold for the receiver and transmitter of a modern telephone. The reason for all these different pieces is so that they can easily get the finished telephone out of the mold. Here you can see how accurately the mold maker's work must fit together. Otherwise, there would be lines on the finished product caused by some of the plastic material being forced into any faulty joints. Probably few people realize that the screws and connecting wires are put in during the molding, and the telephone is actually molded round them. Meanwhile, the mold we left doing its job is now due to be opened after a period of about three minutes. The length of time a molding takes to cook right through depends on its thickness. And now we see what comes out of our mold, the base of a telephone set, with its full depth of color and a hard, shiny surface. The hand section made from another mold is ready too. It's still very hot, so the workman has to wear asbestos gloves while he strips off the loose metal parts of the mold and prepares our new telephone for its final polish. Meanwhile, don't forget how important plastics are to all other forms of communication. Cables that span the world are covered with plastic material. Its uses in radio are too many to describe. Television will owe even more to plastics than it did before the war. Much bigger molds and presses are used to make things like radio cabinets or dashboards for cars and planes. Instead of powder, ingredients are in pellets of a definite weight. This saves the time and trouble of weighing out vast quantities of powder every time a big press is refilled. Hair combs are mass produced by yet another plastic process. This is where a charge of powder is injected by a rapid production molding machine. You can watch a continuous flow of newly molded combs dropping out of the machine. There are colored ones and combs that look like tortoiseshell. It all depends on the ingredients in the powder. After molding, the newly created articles go through the finishing shop to be given a final polishing. If you want to know how plastics are made, you also need to see what is called laminating. This great machine is impregnating paper with synthetic resin in a liquid form. The liquid can be any color you like, and from time to time an operator cuts out test pieces of the material to see whether the right amount of resin is soaking into the paper. Incidentally, the plastic industry doesn't provide a dustbin for all the waste paper in the country. These are special papers made for the industry, and their nature varies according to what the finished sheet is going to become. When the impregnated paper has been cut to size, it is made into boards of whatever thickness is needed. To make them, stacks of this treated paper are placed between polished steel sheets to give the final board a glaze and put into a steam-heated press. Afterwards, the laminated material becomes anything from tabletops and doors to parts of aircraft and wall panels. It seems incredible that gear wheels should be made of impregnated fabric. But the cut circles of fabric being placed in this heated press are the beginning of a modern gear wheel that can stand up to almost anything. We'll come back to this story in a moment, as the wall panels that began with impregnated paper are now coming out of the press in the shape of newly laminated boards. You'll see how it happened. The effect of the heat on the resinoid in the impregnated paper made it plastic, and that enabled the paper to be pressed into a solid, close-knit board which cools before it leaves the press. So now it goes away to be made into those tabletops and shop counters. Meanwhile, we must keep an eye on the fabric press, which has already been loaded and is closing down. Other things can be laminated besides paper and fabric. Wood and other different materials can be treated in the same way. Many types of aircraft, for instance, are fitted with propellers made of laminated wood. At this stage, the laminated blocks are ready for use. And when the glazing plates are removed, you can see the glossy surface of the finished product. They get this through contact with polished metal sheets. 
for while they're still in the plastic stage, they take up the surface of the polished metal. And the finished article cannot be marked by hot dishes like the dining room table. And now, what is happening to the gear wheel? The fabric press is opening, and we find the circles of impregnated fabric have combined into a solid block. This block, which is in fact our embryo gear wheel, can absorb all kinds of shocks and stresses. When machined, the gear wheel will run silently. It won't rust, and often it will outlast a metal gear. And remember, it's still only made of fabric and plastic. Large hollow tubes for insulators are made of impregnated paper. Our old friends, the resinoid binders, are almost perfect insulators, and nearly all laminated plastic materials used in electrical work have a paper base. It's quite a spectacular sight to watch these great tubes being made. The impregnated paper is wound onto steel drums under heat and pressure, and you can get an idea of the size of the finished tube when you see it inspected. These tubes are made in a great variety of sizes and have many more uses. Heavy tubes for insulating are made of the same material. They are stronger than their porcelain forebears. Also, they can be formed more accurately. This insulating material is so hard and tough, it can be machined in the engineering shop like steel or other metal. Here you see the beginning of the heart of an insulator for a giant power transformer. Insulators like this from British factories are used nearly all over the world. In the final assembly stage, it is having the watershed put on to keep out the damp and effects of bad weather. But the watershed acts like a series of umbrellas made of porcelain, keeping out the rain. The test is a force of 130,000 volts, which it withstands quite easily. So another new insulator is ready for work. Knitting needles and buttons come from a plastic called casein, which originates in skimmed milk. And casein, like most plastics, is non-inflammable. It begins with a finely ground powder, which is put into mixing machines. Then they add the dye for whatever color the knitting needles are going to be. And after the mixing process, the powder is fed into a heated machine where it becomes plastic and out come our knitting needles. Buttons are cut from rods of a larger diameter, otherwise they start life in the same way. Yes, there are casein sheets too, only these are made from small pellets, which are placed in moulds and heated in a press. A casein sheet may reappear on your dressing table in the shape of hairbrushes and mirrors, or it may become plugs for wireless sets, paper knives, umbrella handles, ornaments, jewellery. Celluloid, the first plastic, came into existence about 70 years ago. But in spite of the widespread use of all the newer plastics, celluloid continues to be in increasing demand. Films use up a lot of it, which explains a part of this demand. Raw cellulose, having been combined with acids and alcohol, goes through a variety of processes until it enters these kneading machines. They add to it a camphor and a solvent, followed by the colouring agent. Briefly, that is the start of celluloid. Then the revolving blades tear and turn the mixture under heat for a few hours until it becomes plastic. In this case, it comes out looking like a very tough, rubbery monster. This rubbery stuff goes onto hot rollers to be consolidated and hardened. Look at it now, and you'll find it looks like crepe rubber hide. These are cut and trimmed into a standard size, usually two feet by four and a half feet. Incidentally, they don't waste anything here for all the trimmings will go back over the rollers again.
Now the hides are to be formed into a block. To do this, a number of them are put onto a heavy cast iron table. If they want to get a tortoiseshell effect or mother of pearl, they include hides of varying colors. And in the hot pressing process, the hides combine into a solid block about six inches thick. The pressure is about a ton per square inch. So it means they use a 1500 ton press. And the material is heated very slowly and kept under pressure for about 12 hours. A block of celluloid comes out. It is still on its metal base, you notice and it goes into a machine which shaves it into thick or thin sheets. They may be as thin as four thousandths of an inch or up to more than an inch thick. The thick ones are wanted for things like knife handles and the thin ones are for making table tennis balls and dolls. Transparent sheets are used in the little case that holds your season ticket. Again, the glossing effect is got by reheating the sheets in contact with brightly polished metal plates. Once more, it needs quite a lot of pressure. The operators are taking out the newly polished sheets while at the same time they are preparing sheets which still have to go into the press. Celluloid, like all plastics, has a very great number of uses. Here you see a more expensive type of comb being cut from a solid piece. The comb is cut with a circular saw, which you can see cutting out the teeth. Afterwards, the points are carefully smoothed and beveled with an abrasive compound and later the whole comb will be polished on a buffing wheel. Toothbrushes are the most familiar plastic in everybody's daily life and celluloid is an ideal material for making them as it is hygienic besides being very strong. Of course, as you know, toothbrushes are made in many colors and the latest bristles are made of a plastic too. The handles are made first. Then this machine drills the holes and inserts the bristles. And it is only the final buffing and polishing which has to be done by hand. Another of the many ways reheated plastic material can be worked is in making tubes for bicycle pumps. Here is the tube coming out of the machine. 17 different plastics are in wide use in industry today and there are others less well known. Others yet again are still in the research stage. We use plastics in every aspect of our lives. Engineering, the home, decoration, medicine, art, and games. Yes, it is plastics that make so many things possible today, and the story has only begun. <laughs>